the natural world, it's a pretty crazy place, right? It's always changing. In fact, constant change seems to be the only thing that doesn't change. But once we get past our purely visceral reaction to this ever-shifting landscape, we can begin to see that nature is trying to tell us something. Hi, I'm Kurt McDonald, and I teach and talk about nature. No, not in a granola, namaste, I come from Boulder, Colorado kind of way. Although I did love going to school there. But rather, as I see it, nature is the quintessential problem solver. After all, it's been working on this survive and thrive thing for nearly four billion years. And over that huge expanse of time, life is invented and reinvented, competed and contested, and transformed and translocated to almost every imaginable place on the planet. And the fact that we're here today, along with millions of other living species, well, that's proof positive that it's done something right. You see, in nature, there are no bailouts or do-overs. If something doesn't work or it executes a bad strategy, it ceases to exist. It goes extinct. Well, what survives then? What survives are tactics, behaviors, and approaches that have, to this point, kept species alive. They're empirically successful, and paying attention to them can help us succeed against our decidedly human challenges. So what's this talk about exactly? Well, it's about biomimicry. This rapidly expanding field has been increasingly making headlines as engineers and architects, scientists and artists borrow design features from nature to produce some really amazing things. For example, the Namib beetle, it has a shell that can extract water directly from the air. And its design lies at the heart of a new technology aimed at harvesting water in drought-stricken areas. Or a molecular understanding of how these aquatic muscles cement themselves in the inner tidal zone? Well, that's led to the production of a new coating on prosthetics that makes surgical implants much less likely to fail inside their patients. And finally, the toxin-secreting skin of this guy, the poison dart frog, well, that served as a template for a new antifreeze-emitting membrane that may one day cover airplane wings and eliminate that really terrible time. We all sit on the tarmac waiting for de-icing. But biomimicry is much more than emulating organism anatomy and biochemistry. Studying nature also affords us strategies for our personal and professional success, like ways of warding off competitors, or handling resource scarcity, working together, or in the case of today's talk, approaching the inevitability of chaos. Today's story begins like all good stories should, with my childhood growing up in the wilderness of Wyoming. Yep, that's me, just a couple of years ago. And from the look on my face, I was thrilled to grow up in Wyoming. But it was great, actually. This seemingly unfenced expanse of the world to explore. And while there were plenty of adventures, one of the most unforgettable events of my youth were the forest fires that consumed Yellowstone National Park in 1988. This memory is indelible, partly because of the acrid smoke that filled the skies and stung my eyes and burned my lungs when I'd go out to play, and partly because of my dad, who was a member of the fire service and would tell us what the firefighters would encounter on a daily basis. And by all these accounts, these fires were the epitome of a hot, full-throated chaos, this unstoppable conflagration that eventually consumed over 790,000 acres of the park. That's huge. That's larger than the entire state of Rhode Island. But what made these fires so big, so uncontrollable, and so devastating? Well, to answer that question, we have to take a step back in history. You see, in the early 20th century, there was a series of notable wildfires that led the United States to adopt a zero-tolerance policy for fire. Like many things that the United States decides to focus on, from landing on the moon to the Manhattan Project, our policy of fire suppression was unbelievably successful. Too successful. In our attempt to freeze forests in time, to preserve some imaginary status quo, the forces of nature they silently built up behind our dam of valiant effort to prevent change. 
fallen trees and dead branches, dried pine needles and leaf litter, it all accumulated and it turned Yellowstone National Park into an enormous fire pit filled with kindling. All it took was a spark, or in this case, some lightning, and the rest was history. And at this stage of the story, we've encountered our first nature-inspired lesson. Namely, the change is inevitable, but you probably already knew that. But more importantly, trying to prevent it, trying to preserve some moment in time as if it represents an ideal, that's, all, that's impossible. It only delays the inevitable and makes the eventual transition even more explosive. But this lesson, it doesn't just pertain to forest management. It applies to our social practices, our business policies, our function of government, and even our own individual lives. It's easy to get trapped into thinking that things need to stay the same, to remain in some imagined and hypothetical heyday. After all, predictability, hearkening back to those good old days, that's really comforting, whereas change is psychologically unsettling. But recognizing change's existence, and more importantly, embracing its inevitability, well, nature has shown me that that's the first step to living a more resilient life. But our story has to continue. These Yellowstone infernos, they raged on for months. And when the early winter sleet and snow finally extinguished the flames, it looked hopeless. These black toothpicks dotted the seemingly sterile landscape. Retreating animals were nowhere to be found. And the scorched soil, it gave rise really only to the smell of smoke. It looked bleak. It looked like this change was unequivocally bad. But then, the forest did what has to happen in the face of chaos. It embraced it and took full advantage of the new normal. You see, the ashen soil, it was actually filled with nutrients released by the fire. Pine cones, long ago programmed by an intimate relationship with flame, opened and sowed new seeds into the environment. Whole swaths of previously dense forests were thinned, and this, this allowed young aspen trees to grow. And with the return of the aspens, so too came the elk who were drawn in by its tender pulp. And an increase in aspens, that also took pressure off the willow population. And a more hardy willow population slowed riverbank erosion. You see, the changes, they cascaded through the environment. And despite our worst fears for the chaos and uncertainty of the fire, everything worked out. And here, we've encountered our second nature-inspired lesson that we too should be like Yellowstone, beautiful, marvelously complex, accepting of the fact that life's chaotic, but primed to take full advantage of the opportunities that that chaos creates. If Yellowstone can bounce back from the decided devastation of a fire long overdue, we should have hope that we too can overcome our own disasters and find opportunity in the chaos that swirls around us. But you know, it doesn't take a once-in-a-lifetime headline-capturing natural disaster to teach us something important. Rather, valuable lessons are playing out in every nook, cranny, and crevice where life resides, and that's pretty much everywhere, including the ocean, where we'll meet our next inspiring organism. And here, I have to take just a moment to thank Pixar for timing the release of Finding Dory to perfectly coincide with this talk. And Finding Dory is perfect because it reminds us of our original underwater protagonist, Nemo. As I'm sure you all know, Nemo is a clownfish, and clownfish are amazing. Take a moment to imagine yourself as a clownfish, living in the colorful chaos of the Great Barrier Reef. Probably the first thing that you envision is your anemone, whose soft tentacles gently wave across your body without so much as causing discomfort despite the fact they're laced with a toxin so powerful they can paralyze your would-be predators almost instantly. The anemone, it's your protective partner, and you rarely, if ever, venture away from it. And why in the world would you? It has everything you need, including some clownfish that you share it with. If your clownfish compatriots are typical, there is a single female. As the largest fish in the anemone, she's atop the social hierarchy, and beside her, Beside her is a male breeding partner, and inevitably skittering about our number of juvenile males. 
Despite the really interesting absence of adolescent females, this is a pretty cozy little unit of clownfish. And for now, all's well in the anemone. But no matter how much we or these clownfish wish it otherwise, this seemingly idyllic situation is destined to change. You knew that was coming, right? Whether from old age or an unfortunate disease or being plucked out by a human for someone's aquaria, the female will one day go missing. After all, for these fish, just as it is for us, nothing's set in stone. At some moment, perhaps foreshadowed, perhaps not, the female will disappear. Unlike a forest fire, this event won't be observable from outer space or garner worldwide attention. In fact, for much of the world, this tiny event will go entirely unnoticed. But to the clownfish, and you're still imagining yourself as a clownfish right now, right? It means everything. The matriarch has disappeared. And given the absence of other females in the anemone, Dreams of future generations, future Nemo-like offspring have vanished with her. These males, they're now left trapped in the fractured family that is this femaleless anemone. And this seemingly solemn situation teaches us a third nature-inspired lesson. Namely, that change-induced chaos strikes on every level. Yeah, sometimes it's global, worthy of coverage in a news cycle and observable to everyone. But equally important is the chaos that affects our intimate lives. The quiet chaos that only affects our little microcosm is observable only to us, but whose impacts are just as monumental. Like the chaos that consumes us when we're confronted by an unexpected illness. Like cancer. When we learn we've been looked over for an opportunity that we thought was everything. When we unexpectedly learned we were pregnant. Or that we weren't, or when we were faced with any endless number of personal storms that may not be large enough to register on the universe's Richter scale, but mean everything to us, our stories, our chaos. We all have it, you and me, because when we're talking about chaos, scale doesn't matter, but what does matter is how we respond. So let's return to the crestfallen anemone to observe just how nature has learned to carry on. Make no mistake, the loss of the female is decidedly bad. But instead of succumbing to a powerless paralysis, things immediately start to happen. Action ensues. Over the course of the next two weeks, the largest male, the one who just lost his breeding partner, begins a remarkable transformation, literally. His body lengthens. He gains mass. His behavior changes. He takes over the recently vanquished responsibility of defending his cohort. But more importantly, he undergoes the physical and hormonal transformations to become a female. At the same time, the largest juvenile male sees his opportunity and makes a mad dash towards sexual maturity and adulthood. In all, Instead of passively observing this void, giving in to its destructive pull, these small fish, in their decidedly small place in the universe, have learned how to survive, how to thrive in the face of their own change-induced chaos. And this leaves us with our fourth and final lesson. It's one of resilience and one of optimism. Take a moment to look around. No doubt we are surrounded by challenging change and its associated chaos. From the conflict that tears at our social fabric to our contentious political atmosphere. From terrorism to the rekindling of a cold war. From the emergence of new disruptive technologies and business practices to our own personal chaos that's left those physical and emotional scars that we all bear. It's easy to be consumed by chaos to long for a simpler time in the past and to forget that the past wasn't that perfect in the first place. But the inevitability of change will never change, just like in Yellowstone, the anemone, and everywhere in between. Instead of struggling against that idea, or worse yet, giving in and giving up, we need to actively seek out the more disguised but ever-present opportunity that chaos creates. 
The opportunity that nature has shown me is always there. The opportunity for us to find a way forward, not just to survive, but to thrive. Thank you very much.